uh, late 50s, and during your various jobs, you do the evening rounds of pubs and clubs as a singer. Now, you and Shirley meet in 1961, both casualties of teenage marriages that didn't work out. What a day that was. <laughs> ah, I was going to ask Shirley, how did you first meet? Well, we, um, we both went to a, a, a local calf in Hornsey, and um, where all the teddy boys and that used to hang around there, and, um, <laughs> and uh, they had a jukebox, and they were playing on this jukebox, and he came up and asked me if I wanted to ever da dance with him a jive, and I said no, because I thought he was too flash. You never said no. I did. You went off. <laughs> the next time I did see him, he knocked at my door of my flat. And uh, he was looking for a mutual friend of ours who was supposed to come, be coming to my, my house. And I'd got this stew on the, on the, <laughs> up in the, on, on the top of the oven with a load of dumplings in. And uh, I said, would you like a bit? Ooh, mercy, sir. Ooh, yes, ooh, mm. That was it. He ate half me stew, half me dumplings, and that was it. He was... Yeah. And nowadays, nowadays, I say, where do you want to go for holiday dance? I don't know, it's somebody exotic. I said, why don't you try the kitchen? <laughs> well, after that gruelling start, you set up home with your children in an East London flat and you supplement your three pounds a night stand-up comic fees by working during the day as a film extra and stand-in stuntman. At least you knew your left hand from your right hand, Mike. Veteran stunt master Nosha Powell. Oh, big Nosha! So, Nosha, he was a bit uh, handy, was he, on the film set? Well, he was a little bit tasty. I'm going to say, back in the the 60s, when all the big action stuff was being made at L Street. I can remember one particular occasion when uh, we were doing a rental in Hopkirk, when Mike Pratt had to hit him with a left hook. And he went away with Rocky Taylor, who's sitting over there, who was Mike Pratt's double, and to practice this left hook, left hook, left hook. And the director said, right, I'm ready for a take. Back they went. Action! And this actor, Mike Pratt, slammed the biggest right hand that you've ever come across right on his chin. He stepped back, went, <coughs> looked at me and Rocky, give us a sly wink, and he said to the actor, if that's as hard as you get it, you're bang in trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Are you and Shirley marry at Redbridge Registry Office in Essex on August the 5th, 1971. Your honeymoon is a long weekend at Butlins in Minehead. Uh, <laughs> Shirley, actually, that proved to be a turning point in Mike's career, didn't it? Yes, it did. In, uh, when we were there, um, we, we, he decided that he was going to go in for a, a, the competition. They were running two, two different competitions. One was in the theatre for comedians and anything else like that. The other was a singing competition and uh, so Mike went in for both. But um, they don't, they'd only let him win one of them and go ahead um, through to the, the area finals and all that kind of thing and he ended up at the London Palladium. Well, as, as you said, the rules meant that you could only do one at a time and here you are waiting in the wings at the London Palladium to do Look your... It's lovely, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful? You're waiting to do the comedy. You finish as runner-up in the final and you win a nationwide tour. Now, among the entertainers you often shared the dressing room with in those days was a man who, with his partner, made it to the top of the bill at about the same time as you. Michael, do you remember the old days when we always used to cram in the same dressing room and fight over the hook? Captain Grumpy. <laughs> Roger DeCourcy and Nookie. Captain Grumpy. <laughs> Roger, remind us of the early days. Early days, thank you, Michael. Early days. Uh, yeah, I've put this thing away. I think uh, we, had, we had great times in the old days, sharing dressing rooms, I said, but uh, 
Michael obviously is a, is a, a different man. He's, he's a lovely fellow, and it was a great uh, it was a great time. Now, often, well, we uh, do enjoy working with you, <laughs> grunty or not. <laughs> but his lips still move. <laughs> Now, in 1972, you hear on the show business Grapevine that Granada TV are planning a second series of The Comedians. Uh, you go to extreme lengths to earn a place on the show. You made a bit of a pest of yourself, Mike, but you had the last laugh. The creator and producer of Comedians, Johnny, Johnny Ham. Ham. Anything that I've achieved in my life today as regards in show business all started off with the comedians and it was all down to this man, Mr Johnny Ham. Thank you, sir. He was yeah. certainly keen, wasn't he? He was, he was very keen. Uh, in fact, I think you were on the second series. The first series that we did was very popular, but I noticed that all the, the, the stars that came out of that were northerners. And I was desperate for a London comic. And I was at home one night and the phone rang and he said, uh, Hello, Mr Ham, you don't know me. He said, um, uh, I'm a comedian. I said, how did you get my number? He said, your assistant, Lucinda, at Granada gave it to me. Uh, and he said, I made a laugh over the telephone. I said, well, go on then, make me laugh over the telephone. Right, and you did. And, do you remember the game? Yeah, yeah, there was two, uh, I think it was uh, two geese flying up the motorway and all of a sudden a jumbo jet went over the top and one goose sent the other one, I wish I could fly that out. And the other one said, you would do if you had four bums on fire. <laughs> And he got the job. And he got the job. Yeah. Johnny, thank well done, you very much. Thank you, sir. And here's another sample of the material that made you an instant hit on the comedians and made you a star. You've seen Bernard Mendel on the show many, many times. <laughs> Dear old Bernard. Tight, always mean. He's mean. <laughs> Bernard Manning drinks whiskey and whole licks. <laughs> When it's his turn to pay, he's asleep. Now, the warm tribute you offered to your old friend is about to be returned. Bernard Manning. Hello, Mike. Hope you're having a good time tonight. <laughs> this is your night. We go back a long time, you and I. Remember the London Palladium days? Weeks and weeks of the London Palladium and the Royal Command performance. When the Queen said, I stood next to you, you heard her say it. She said, you're the funniest man I've ever seen in my life. Who's your friend? <laughs> Give me a nice story. A fellow goes in a pub, says, eight brandies, please. Knocks the eight brandies back. He said, I shouldn't be drinking like this with what I've got. She said, what have you got? He says, not a penny. <laughs> you can have that one. Have a good night. My love to all your family. Bernard Manning, thank, thank you. you and tonight, Mike, I think you'll be really delighted to know we're going to reunite you with another shy but talented performer from those early days. <laughs> uh, Michael. That's what's kept us going. And that's what keeps audiences laughing. It could possibly be Frank Carson. <laughs> Well, just a few weeks ago, we were in a bar, <laughs> and this fellow said, are you Mike Reed, the famous comedian? He said, I'm from Scotland. He said, do you like Burns? He said, yes. And he stuck a fag in his neck. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm, I'll do this very quickly, because... Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no but this is very funny. <laughs> That's not like you. Just... <laughs> Well, that's not like you do hard lib either. Oh. <laughs> now, so, wait a minute. Just a few weeks ago, <laughs> I get this cabaret club and opened up my suit and I've forgotten my jacket. So the fellow said to me, Oh, Reedy was here last week and he left his jacket. Oh, so that's, that's lovely. So I put the jacket on, there's the cabaret. Pars it up and sends it to Reedy. Now he didn't know who'd send it, but apparently the fellow at the cabaret club had said, Frank, if you want to send it on to you. He rings me up and said, You were wearing my jacket. I said, Why? He said, It stunk. <laughs> I said, No, no, it wasn't me, it was your act. <laughs> Hold on! 
a star like me appears on a show like this. So, Frank Carson, this Lose is your time. life. <laughs> Using an actor's voice. Thank you. And... <laughs> and as Frank finally sits, let me remind you that there are some more of your comedian chums here tonight. Mike Burton. Michael. Willie Thompson. Will Owens. Oh, nice to see you. Mick Pugh. Michael. And Keith O'Keefe. Keith. Well, now, you combine singing and comedy, and in 1975, you have a top ten hit with this recording. There once was an ugly button. The feathers all stabbing and brown And the other birds in so many words said Oi! Get out of town! Oi, Mush! Get out of Yeah, town. you! Get out Move your Harris! Get out of town! As well as all that, you win an award as best children's entertainer for Runaround. Indeed, life and your career seem to be moving along at a steady and satisfying pace. But, as I said earlier, there have been tears among the laughter. And it would not be a full account of your life if we didn't mention that you and Shirley have had to overcome personal tragedies. In 1990, your son, Mark, took his own life, and just four months later, Mark's daughter, Kirsty, one of the twins, was the victim of a cot death. Mm. Now, Tony Lewis, you've been the manager of this man for, what, 18 years, and you've seen at close hand how he and Shirley have coped. Yes, they are a very close-knit family, and they... They gave each other great strength during that very sad time. Mike, being the pro that he is, still went to EastEnders every day to work. But the hardest part, I think, for him was of an evening when he had to stand on stage and be the funny man for an hour and a quarter doing comedy, feeling the way he was. But it proves, I think, the old saying that there's no one more serious in life than a clown and both Anita and I send our love to you both and we're thrilled for the tribute that you're receiving tonight. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Well, back to your career, Mike. Uh, quite recently you've been working with another well-known refugee from Albert Square. Fee-fi-fo-fum. <laughs> I smell the blood of an English comedian. <laughs> we knew him as Nasty Nick Cotton. It's John Altman. <laughs> John, what have, what have you two been up to? Well, Mike, Mike gave me a call recently, and uh, he's, doing a, so he's doing this spectacular stage show. And he also played a wicked giant. Why? I don't know. Yeah, and I, uh, I said, well, hang on a minute, you know, I mean, I'm not exactly uh, built like that. So uh, he said, no, it's all right, I'll put you on a, a special diet, a bodybuilding diet, he said. So it'll be uh, whale meat on Monday, whale meat Tuesday, yeah? Whale meat Wednesday. Don't you Hang me. on a minute. If it's whale Thursday... Whale meat again. <laughs> <Don't know where. laughs> John, thank John. you. Beautiful set. Thanks okay. for coming, sir. Appreciate it. God bless you. Now, Ross Kemp, your character, Grant Mitchell, took over from Frank behind the bar at the Victoria, didn't he? What, what was that like? Hard act to follow, really. And we want your back, Mike, so hurry up back to us, mate. Ew. Ew. Now, back in 1976, you appeared in a television special with a long-time friend and famous Cockney Sparrow, and here you are getting lessons on how to talk proper. Now, you place your hand there. Mm, terrific. Terrific. <laughs> you are tummy. I'm oh, sorry. And it travels upwards mm. and upwards. Pausing only or minor scenery. <laughs> your voice booms out over the echo chamber right here. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have an advantage over you. I have twin speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that is the new voice being heard in the square these days. And if I had my way, darling, you'd be back in the square. Barbara Windsor. Oh. 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 
Uh, please carry on. Oh, oh, we all do, darling. Well, when the lovely Sid James went to that great big carry-on in the sky, I said to the carry-on producers, there's only one person who can take over Sid's crown, and that's the wonderful Mike Reed, and I think that's a great compliment, don't you, darling? Yes, do, darling. And when he was in EastEnders, he used to say to me, here, darling, wouldn't it be lovely if he was in EastEnders? And I'd say, yeah, 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 yeah. And what happens? I go into EastEnders and he does a runner. <laughs> Congratulations, sweet man, on tonight. And I just want to say something, ladies and gentlemen. Mike and Shirley Reed, two more wonderful friends you couldn't wish to have. Whenever there's anything wrong, they're there for you. God bless you, sweetie. Thank you, Thank you Barbara. Shirley, I'm told that you have what you call the, the three G's that have helped Mike through difficult times. Yeah. In actual fact, Michael, it's four G's. We've got... Mike's got his golf, and then I introduced him to gardening, which he does like doing. He, you know, he does a bit anyway. A bit? <laughs> well, he sits on the lawn mower and mows the lawn. Seven hours it takes me. <laughs> And that's on in the front room carpet. <laughs> and then we... The, the, the third one is that we've got a good, solid marriage. And the fourth one is that we've got our grandchildren. And we absolutely, both of us, adore all our grandchildren. And well, they mean a lot to us. Six of them have been given late-night passes to be with you tonight. Oh, there is no. Scott, Claire, oh. Lee, Michael, Jade and Lucy. Two years ago, Mike, your grandson in Houston was diagnosed as having a major heart problem and you dashed out to America with Shirley while he underwent surgery. And now he's well enough to have made the return journey. Three-year-old Billy. This is your life. Thank you very much. We've had.